Oh yeah, glory, 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 man. What a what a majestic song. What a what a wonderful praise and worship to the Lord. I hope that you uh, appreciate and and I know lots of times we don't really truly appreciate because we don't have anything to uh to lay beside it. We we don't have experiences where we've been many years in in service in in, in church and sanctuary and not had an opportunity to really just lift our praise and our worship to the Lord um, for whatever reason that might be. But if you've, if you've ever had experience like that and you've kind of had to just hold yourself and, um, and, you know, and not have that opportunity when you now have it, it's just wonderful. Thank you, team. You, you guys just bless us so much. And, and, it, and give us an opportunity to worship and praise and uh, the variety of stuff that you do just it takes us up and down and all around and, and we love every bit of it. And um, it's just awesome. It really is awesome. Uh, we're looking today, we're starting a new series today. I, I call it Away, Away in the Wilderness. However, I, I think I'll, I may even change the name and call it uh, Graves into Gardens because, <laughs> because that's really, uh, really what it's about. It's about how uh, the Lord takes us in the middle of our wilderness, our deserts, our barren lands, and how he strengthens us. And, and he actually uses these things that come against us as instruments to bless our life and to work in our life. As the book of Isaiah is, is a truly remarkable book. I, I know that many of you have, have read the book of Isaiah many times. You've heard passages from the book of Isaiah many times. As a matter of fact, most of the passages in the book of Isaiah uh, that talk about the Messiah, which, by the way, there are 53 sections in 66 books, 53 sections that talk about the Messiah, that are talking about a Messiah that would come 700 years in the future and would change the spiritual structure and life of this entire world, the nation of Israel, and certainly uh, our lives as, as those who have been grafted in. Uh, when Israel rejected, uh, that opened the door for us, for all of us Gentiles, to come on in and to be grafted into the vine, so to speak. Let me read you a, a, a couple of very familiar passages so you can see what I mean about Isaiah. Uh, much of what we know about Jesus as far as how he looked on the cross, uh, what his feelings were, what his overall purpose was on this earth, we don't learn that from the Gospels. Now, we, we, get every, we get Jesus' life in the Gospels, and we see Jesus moving through the Gospels. But we learn about that, and we learn what we're looking at and what we're looking to in the book of Isaiah. Let me just give you a couple of examples. This is Isaiah 7, verse 14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall, and shall call his name Emmanuel. And we know, of course, obviously that's exactly what happened. Isaiah 9, verse 2. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. Talking about Jesus. Verse 6 of that same chapter. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, the High King of Heaven, my King forever. <laughs> yeah. Isaiah told us, and of course Isaiah 53, you know the whole chapter is about Jesus, and it's about the it's a messianic chapter, actually. The whole chapter. I just chose about three verses out of there. Look at them. Verse 4. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone into his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Well, you, we could go on for a long time because Isaiah is full of passages concerning the Messiah. 
Now, I don't know how many classical music fans we have here, but you really don't even have to be a classical fan to have heard Handel's Messiah, right? At Christmas and Easter, there's a Christmas section and there's an Easter section, and Handel wrote it, and it's obviously a classic, and it's done every Easter, especially by um, uh, big choirs and, and big sophisticated music issues and so forth. And music ministers and all know this, but most of the passages that are the words in Handel's Messiah were taken right out of the book of, of Isaiah. They came right out of that book. Isaiah 35 is a messianic chapter in the book of Isaiah, just like Isaiah 53, where every verse in that chapter is about the Messiah that to them would come. I mean, you, you have to understand when you're reading Isaiah that Isaiah's talking about a Messiah that 700 years from then will come. So they were looking forward to the Messiah by what was said here. And of course, obviously, we're looking back at the Messiah because the Messiah has come and we know what the Messiah has done and we know all about the Messiah because we have seen him face to face, at least on this earth. And one day, thank the Lord, we'll see him face to face and we'll know him like he knows us. And that's a wonderful thing. But Isaiah, Isaiah 35 is a chapter that talks about the Messiah. And, um, and to me, uh, when I read it, I thought, my goodness, this is just the perfect picture of how the Lord makes a way for us in the wilderness. Because we've all, we all have wilderness in our life. You know, we all have devastating moments in our life. We all have uh, moments where our dreams die. Uh, we have moments where we, you know, for lack of a better way to say it, we, we have a funeral for our hopes because they've, they've passed away and life beats us up and life tears us down, and many times we feel helpless and hopeless. We feel like a, like a dry desert, like our life has become barren, and it's, and it's a wilderness. Well, it's at that time in our life when the Lord comes and shows himself strong in our behalf. The Lord specializes in miracles, and he specializes in changing lives. He specializes actually in resurrections. And so he's the only one, and when we were singing, when we were singing Graves in the Garden, I'm thinking, yes, you are the only one who can. He's the only one that can, that can make a way in the wilderness. He's the only one that can make streams in the wasteland. He's the only one that can turn our mourning into dancing. He's the only one that can give us beauty for ashes. He's the only one that can take a grave and make a garden out of it because his love endures forever and his faithfulness continues to every generation. So this series is about four blessings that Jesus brings into our lives when he becomes our Messiah. When you open your life and you invite Christ in, you have received the Messiah. And when you receive him, he brings four blessings into your life with him that will make a way for you in the wilderness that you find yourself in. And I don't think I have to really preach very hard to convince you that at this time in the world we live in, this is a very tough time, a barren wilderness. I, I, it's easy to feel that you've lost your direction uh, it's easy to become hopeless. If you watch the news, you're going to become hopeless. I'm going to tell you that. And feel helpless because stuff just keeps happening every day that's just gigantic stuff. And we go, when will it stop? And how can we stop this? And the answer is, we can't. But God specializes in these kind of things. And don't think that any of this stuff uh, surprises God. God is in charge. And I'm sure that every bit of this stuff fits right into the perfect uh, prophetic plan. Uh, it does to me, but anyway, I, uh, I know the Lord's got in charge. And um, so even though we're living in, 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 in a world uh, with desolate evil involved in it, uh, he can make a way in the wilderness. I'm sure you'll remember this because I, I preached about it for about four or five messages. We started in the garden. You remember all of this, uh, this whole world started in, in a garden. 
and, and, and God created a paradise garden and he put Adam and Eve in the garden. And God had fellowship with them. And every day, the Bible says, in the cool of the day, God would come down and meet with them and walk with them and talk with them in the garden to soothe them and to comfort them and to, and to have fellowship with them. Quite interestingly to me, uh, the very first thing that the resurrected Messiah, Jesus, did was to walk with his mother in a garden and to comfort her and to give her peace. So the Lord specializes in taking catastrophic situations and turning them into blessings and gardens in our life. So this is what will happen when the Messiah comes, according to Isaiah 35, and this is what Jesus brings with him into your life. Let's read Isaiah 35, first verse or so, first three, two or three verses. The wilderness and the wasteland shall be glad for them. Now this is what God says to Israel. You know, you're a barren, desolate wasteland. You're a people out of place. There's nothing but empty desert and barrenness and there's no life and no victory or anything. But he says, he says in verse one, when, when the Messiah comes, the wilderness and the wasteland shall be glad for them and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice even with joy and singing. All right, now, let me stop there just for one. I'm not gonna stop after every verse. Well, I might, but um, I, I, I don't plan to really, but I, I want you to understand what's happening here <clears throat> because I can, see, I can see that you're not really excited about it. But if you knew, I mean, listen, this is what's happening. This is what's being said here. Um, this passage is, is, is saying, all right, since, since you believed in Jesus Christ as the Messiah, Yeshua is the Hebrew name, uh, a form of Yahusha, which means Joshua. And this is the deliverer. This is Jesus, the Messiah. This is who he's talking about. He said, all right, now, you guys that are reading this in the future, here's what you need to know about this. You Gentiles were once outside of the faith and, 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 and there was no hope for you. But now, because the Messiah has come, you have been grafted in to the vine. At Romans 11, the Apostle Paul says this. He says that the... Um, that, that, that the natural branches of the olive tree have been broken off and the wild branches, everybody look at your neighbor and say, that's you. You're the wild branches. That the natural branches, now, now think about this. This is, what this. this is what Paul says. Paul says, look, God loves you so much that he took some of the natural branches and he broke them off so that he could take you, a wild branch, and graft you in to the tree of righteousness so that everything that he said the Messiah would do for the land nation of Israel, now he's talking to you about these things. Now these things are all about you. And he's saying to us, uh, what was a dry and barren and desert and wasteland is now, is now blossoming abundantly and rejoicing, what does he say, with joy and singing because the Messiah has come. So he says, this is for you guys now. I'm, not, I'm no longer just talking to Israel, I'm talking to you, and this is what you can expect. And then he goes on and he says, the glory of Lebanon shall be given to it. Now we know that Lebanon now is a country, but back then Lebanon was not a country. Back then, Lebanon was a region of northern Canaan, which Canaan is the promised land, and the name Lebanon means fertile soil. 
So what he's saying here is that this land that the Messiah is bringing back to life is a very fertile place. It is truly a garden in the middle of a wilderness. It's unbelievably fruitful in the middle of a, of a desert. So God is saying to us that he's prepared a, a very fruitful, a very fertile garden for, for his people in the middle of their wilderness. And even though we may be living in a horrible, barren, evil world, world, God has prepared for his children a beautiful, fruitful, wonderful, fertile garden for us to live in. So he's trying to get us excited about what he's doing for us in our life. And then he keeps on describing it, the excellence of Carmel and Sharon. Carmel literally means garden land. So he's saying, this is a plentiful, beautiful garden cultivated soil. Now remember, he's talking about in the middle of a desert. This is what's being created in the middle of a desert, in barren wasteland, desert all around it, wilderness all around it. And God said, I'm creating a wonderful, cultivated, beautiful, plentiful cell, a place for my people to inhabit. And it's telling us that God has created a garden with fertile soil and lush surroundings for us in the midst of all of our terrible times in life. He says it's the excellence of Carmel. And then he says, and Sharon. Sharon's another place. I see it perked your interest, right? (laughs) Oh, yes. Sharon is is a coastal region. The Car- Carmel region is here. It's kind of a mountainous region. And then the coastal plain comes down, and that's called Sharon. Sharon is the place where the Song of Solomon takes place. You know, the Song of Solomon, the book in the Old Testament, that's the love story romantic uh, literature in the Old Testament, that pictures Jesus as the bridegroom and the Shulamite woman as the bride, who is a representative of the church, This is, Song of Solomon's talking about Jesus and the church. That's what the Song of Solomon's about. But it uses a bridegroom and a beautiful young Shulamite woman that is the bride. And in chapter two, it's interesting, in chapter two, the first verse of chapter two, the Shulamite woman is speaking and she's talking about herself and she says, I'm the Rose of Sharon. That's where that phrase comes from. I'm the Lily of the Valleys. That's where that comes from. And so it just reiterates the fact that, that the fullness of God is being prepared for us so that in the midst of all of our turmoil and all of our pain and all of our anxiety and all of our strife, and don't tell me you're not feeling this, that God says, I'm preparing a wonderful, fertile, plentiful, beautiful, lush place for you. So don't worry about it, is what he's saying, because I've got some blessings for you in the middle of the wilderness I'm making a way. Look at it, it goes on in verse three. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the excellency of our God. Now, here comes some, here comes some of the blessing. Strengthen the weak hands, he says and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who are fearful hearted, be strong, do not fear. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God, he will come and save you. So when Jesus comes into your life, he's gonna bring you strength. So today we're talking about the blessing of strength. When he comes into your life, the first blessing to make a way in the wilderness for us is he's going to bring strength into our life. Look at how he says it in verse three. He says, I'm gonna strengthen your weak hands. I'm gonna gonna firm up your feeble knees. You've seen these weak hands and feeble knees? If you hadn't, let me tell you how to see them. You can just see them live anytime you want to. Get your child. Tell them, baby, I want you, hey, come in here. I want you to clean up, pick up this living room. I want you to get the the dishes off the table. I want you to wash the dishes. I want you to make sure you put them up. And you're going to say, they'll go. (laughs) (laughs) That's feeble knees and weak hands. (sighs) It's too much for me. (sighs) Yeah. 
I've practiced that quite a bit. <laughs> yeah, I've seen it a bunch of times, all right? Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to strengthen your weak hands. I'm going to firm up your feeble knees, and I'm going to make strong your fearful heart. All right, let's think about this a second. What is he saying to us? Because we're looking at this and we're saying, all right, when the Messiah comes, he's going to do something with our hands. All right, so what would our hands represent? What, what would he be saying by saying, I'm going to strengthen your weak hands? What do we do with our hands? Well, hands could be what we do. So he could be saying, I'm going to strengthen what you do. You know, hands are used to represent that uh, in the book of James chapter 4. He says, cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify you heart, your heart, you double-minded. What he's saying is, your hands are what you do stuff with. Your hands are what come in contact with the world. I don't know about you, but I take a bath one, day, uh, one time a day whether I need it or not. But I wash my hands many times a day. Why? Because it's my hands that come into contact with the world we live in, right? So they're going to get dirty. They're going to get messed up. So we could let... We could say, all right, here, what, what he's saying to us is, I'm going to strengthen your hands. So he says, all right, I'm going to strengthen what you do. Now, what can our knees represent? Our knees could represent uh, where we go, right? I mean, we walk with our knees, and, and where we go could be our knees. So he's saying, I'm going to strengthen what you do, and I'm going to strengthen where you go. All right, now, what is our fearful heart all about? Well, what does uh, what Proverbs, uh, tw is it tw Proverbs 23 says, um, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So what could, what could our heart represent? How about the way we think? The, what we do, where we go, and what we think. Now, how many of you would not like it if Jesus strengthened what you do, where you go, and how you think? Well, that's what Jesus says he does when he comes into our life. When the Messiah comes, that's what he's all about. All right, let me give you three practical ways that the Messiah brings strength in the wilderness. Let's just take these three, um, these three uh, 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 parts of our body that he uses. All right, first off, number one. Now, this is going to be very practical, all right? This is not high-level theological stuff. This is just... Practically, what is that talking about? All right. He's going to strengthen our weak hands. This is in verse 3. All right. So the Messiah is going to strengthen what we do. So, now follow me. So what do we need to do with our hands that will strengthen what we do? All right. Hands, most often, in the Scripture, are mentioned in one context, and that is that we would worship with our hands. We would raise our hands in worship, right? We would lift our hands to worship the Lord. I mean, even one of the songs we did uh, said, you know, lift your hand, I lift, lift your hands up and, and before him and worship him. And the Bible is filled, filled with connotations where I'm going to ask you to lift your hands in honor of me or in worship of me. So what, what I'm saying is if you are going to strengthen what you do, you must become a worshiper. I mean, look, look, look. Very simply and, 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 and practically, there is one area of life that people can just get really freaked out about. Have you ever been in a church where you just really got freaked out? I mean, you, know, you, you went in there and, and it was like you were expecting one thing and man, they started doing stuff in there and it just freaked you out. Well, do you know what freaks more people out in church than any other single thing? When people lift up their hands and worship the Lord in church. That really, and, and look, I'm not trying, if, if you're this, please don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to bash you, belittle you, or anything. I just know how it feels. And I, I'm telling you that there is strength in worshiping him. And, and when we surrender, there are signs that we surrender. I mean, I, I, I'm, I, I can't stand there flint-hearted and flint 
minded and, and truly w release myself to, to worship him. Now, if you have ever been made uncomfortable by someone lifting their hands in a church service, let me tell you that you are in good company because I too have been where you are. I know how it feels because I really, it, it really didn't bother me for people to raise up their hands and shout and, you know, be excited as long as it was at the right place. Like, it didn't bother me at a football game for somebody to go, yeah, all right. You know, that, that, that didn't bother me at all. Or maybe at a NASCAR event or some other exciting thing that was going on in life. It, it wasn't the raising your hands that really bothered me. It was... Uh, what, why would you want to do that at church? That, you know, you'd be, 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 you know, be, be, be orderly, be in right, you know. But, but it, it, it used to make me feel very uncomfortable. So if you say, I, Pastor, I just don't really feel comfortable with that. And I, let me just say, I know how it feels and I know what you're talking about. Now, let me mention this to you. About probably 20 years ago, roughly now, um, I became, the Lord began to, to deal with me about my own personal feelings and worship uh, and, 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 and um, my surrender totally to him in, in every area of my life. Not to what others think, but, but to him. And so he began to challenge me about this, about, about just, now I know it sounds petty and I know it sounds small, but man, it was a big deal to me to just, lift my hand like that and in front of my family? You know, I was embarrassed. I, it wasn't my personality. And I, so I, would, I struggled with that. And, and I found that once I began to let the Lord speak to me, it became very good and precious and, and wonderful. But over the years, because I've led in Baptist churches all my life, um, I have been confronted with people who don't lift their hands, whole congregations that have never lifted a hand. And so I've found that there are basically four excuses that people have for not lifting their hands in church, in worship at church. And let me just show them to you, and I'm not trying to slap you, but I just want to show you what the excuse is and what God says. Because it doesn't matter what I say. That's just my, my opinion. But what does God say about it? All right, here's the first excuse. Um, I will lift my hands when I get to heaven. Uh, I, don't, I don't feel comfortable. It's not my personality. I, I don't like it. Uh, and I'm not going to do it now, but when I get to heaven, I'm really going to lift my hands and I'm going to worship the Lord. All right, Psalm 63, verses three and four. Because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise you. Thus, I will bless you while I live. I will lift my hands in your name. Now, that's the Bible. That's, that's, that's what God says. Excuse number two. I may not lift my hands, pastor, but I sure lift my heart. Lamentations 3, 41. Let us lift our hearts and hands to God in heaven. Excuse number three. The Bible doesn't specifically tell us to lift our hands in church. Uh, it says, lift your hands, worship, all that, but not specifically instructed to do it in church. Psalm 134, verse 2. <laughs> lift up your hands in the sanctuary. That's, that's what this is, by the way. <laughs> and bless the Lord. Excuse number four. Well, pastor, all those verses that you've called out are all Old Testament scriptures. And I'm a New Testament man myself. And, uh, and so, you know, let me just say, first of all, <laughs> that we are Old and New Testament people. <laughs> God speaks to us in all of his word. But just in case you might be one of those that say, well, the Old Testament talks about it, but not the New. First Timothy 2 is just one place. Uh, verse 8, I desire therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. So as I mentioned before, I understand the feelings of people who are shy or bashful about expressing uh, worship uh, outwardly 
whether it's lifting your hands or, or bowing your face or getting on your knees or what, whatever it might be that's an expression of worship. I can understand that because I grew up in a Baptist church. And I, I, I was saved in a Baptist church. All the churches that I've pastored have been Baptist churches these 48 years. This church, Freedom River Church, is not a Baptist church. It's an independent church. But it's not because I disagree with the theology that Baptists believe or that I, I, I have something against Baptist I, I have nothing. I love Baptist people. I love my church. I was there yesterday preached a funeral of my best friend in high school yesterday at my home church. I love them, man. They, they just blessed in me in so many ways, and they were so kind. and great. There is nothing, I have nothing against any of that. All I'm trying to say by saying that is I was brought up in an environment that was not conducive to the expression of public uh, uh, worship, now, we did lift our hands in the Baptist church, but it was only to vote on something. <laughs> you know, when somebody joined the church, you said, everybody all for it, amen, and then you'd raise your hand to vote somebody in, and then every once in a while, not very often, but every once in a while, uh, you would vote your hand, lift your hand to vote somebody out. You know, we, we did remove some every once in a while. And you'd vote for a pastor or in or out, you know, whichever. So we did lift our hands some, but, but it wasn't in connection with worship. Now, let me tell you the first time that I was confronted with actually raising a hand in the sanctuary on purpose to worship the Lord. It happened in a revival meeting. Do you guys know what a revival meeting is? You've heard the word, right? Revival is a time set aside, usually a week. You have services every night, and you have a, an evangelist that comes in and tries to uh, encourage people to be saved, and everybody tries to bring their friends. I mean, it's just a concerted effort to, for the kingdom and for souls. And uh, it's usually more exciting than regular church services. It's usually planned to be that way. And they have a visiting worship leader and a visiting pastor, and they come in and, and, and preach and do the music. Well, uh, it was in a revival like that. And the minister of music, now that's what we called them back then. Nobody was called a worship leader back then. They were called ministers of music. And the minister of music got up and he was singing something like, uh, um, I don't know, uh, when we all get to heaven or, or uh, uh, power in the blood or something like that. And he got all fired up. And the congregation was just kicking. You know, they were fired up too. And, and, we, and, he, and he sang the first, second, by the way, in, in most Baptist churches, they skip the third verse. I'd hate to be the third verse in the Baptist hymnal because you'd never get sung. They sing the first, second, and last. All right, everybody, let's stand up. Let's sing the first, second, and last verse of number 368. Power in the blood. And, you know, and you take off. And then, so before the last verse, everybody was so fired up. He got all beside himself. And he said, he stopped everybody, and he said, all right, now, before this last verse... What I want us to do on this last verse, let's all, when we sing it, let's all just lift our hands and worship to the Lord as we sing this last verse. And then he just took off and people started lifting their hands. You know, I'm sitting on the front row. I'm the preacher, so I'm sitting on the front row down there waiting to go up. And I'm telling you what I did. Here's what I did. Whenever he said that, I'm, when he said, all right, everybody let's lift your hands. I, in my mind, I said, let's don't lift our hands. And, uh, and, and, and he said, let's lift our hands. And, and people started putting their hands up. And then, and I just, I kind of lift my hands up about like that. I really just kind of lifted my fingers. <laughs> That's what I, what I really did. And I felt so uncomfortable with that because I cared what people thought. Because I thought if I did that, I would look foolish. That somehow that, that, that people would, that would be awkward. And so all it was was a pride issue. That's all it was. I was just too proud to lift my hands. Now, when that's true about your life, let me just mention this one, one thing about pride and humility. Everything to do with God 
is humility based. You have to be humble to do it. You have to be humble to come to the Lord because you've got to admit you're a sinner and that you can't make it and that you need somebody bigger than yourself to carry you over the line, to, to change your life. So that's an act of humility. When you get on your knees to pray, that is an act of humility. Brokenness, bowing. Uh, when you lift your hands to worship him, no matter what others may think, that's an act of humility. And every opportunity that we get in our life to put pride down, we need to take it. Because you can't serve God with pride. What does, the Bible, what does James say? God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Do you know what that word resist is? It, it, it's, a, it's a military word, and it means brings overwhelming force. When you're proud, God is going to bring overwhelming force against your life, and you are not going to be successful. Paul said, I have, it's pretty simple, isn't it, Bill? Paul, yeah, it, Paul said, I have fought the good fight. He identified that there's a good fight in life. You know what the good fight is? With the devil, because you can whip him through the power of the Spirit. You know what the bad fight in life is? with God, because you ain't going to beat God. So anyway, he strengthens us. He brings strength in, in the way we do things through worship. And I worship him by expressing my worship to him unabated because I'm not ashamed to lift my hands or bow my knee or hop around the sanctuary like a bunny rabbit, you know, or whatever it might be that, I, that God wants in my life. Because it's not about what others think. It's about what God deserves. And he deserves all the worship I can give and even more. I, I can't give him enough. He deserves more than I give. All right, let's look at the second thing. He says he's going to make firm our feeble knees. Knees... You know, we we're talking about, we said we'll let our knees represent the way we walk. All right, so what would knees, if hands would be maybe something we use to raise and worship, what would, what would be connected with our knees? Well, prayer, yes, that's right, B. That's right. See, y'all could preach this. This is, this is not complicated. Knees refer to prayer, I, I think. Now, if you're not physically able to get down on your knees and actually bend your knees and pray... I don't think God's going to be offended by that. I don't think God's an egomaniac that you have to perform a certain way in order to make him happy about life. But knees are often in the Bible related to prayer. And let me just give you one example. 1 Kings 8, here it is, verse 54. And so it was when Solomon had finished praying all this prayer and supplication to the Lord that he arose from before the altar of the Lord from kneeling on his knees with his hands spread up to heaven. So prayer is real strength. It will give us real strength in the way we walk in life. Now, I, uh, let me give you a couple of verses here because I wanted to, to show you in Philippians 4. Philippians 4, verse 6, listen to this. You, you, this verse is very familiar to you. Be anxious for nothing. Are you anxious for anything? Now, you know, I'm not trying to get you to confess. This is really kind of rhetorical, really. Don't answer out loud. Um, do, are you anxious? I mean, do, does this time right now, does it make you anxious? If you do ever watch the news, do you get anxious? If you get kicked off of Facebook, do you get anxious about, you know, and all about that? He says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. If you don't pray with thanksgiving, it's just griping in the spirit is all it is. If you don't thank him, all right? Pray, pray, prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. You know what our problem is? Our problem is that we don't pray about everything. Now, we think about praying about it, 
right? I mean, when something comes up, we say, man, I need to pray about that. I don't know. So you're thinking about praying about it, but, but, but the problem is you don't pray about it. And when you don't pray about it, you get anxious about it. And the less you pray about it, the more anxious you become. And so God says, look, quit thinking about praying about it and actually pray about it and, and, and do it. And you can relieve the anxiety of your life. Would that help you to walk straighter, walk with a more firm uh, uh, step? I mean, would this strengthen you in any way? Shh. Yes, it, it's designed to strengthen you. Let me give you one little verse. Uh, and this verse is a one-line verse out of Proverbs 16. And it doesn't sound like it says anything, but I was studying it this week and it really spoke to me. And uh, I'll give you just an insight. It's a vocabulary thing that speaks to me. Here it is, verse 16 of Proverbs, uh, uh, chapter 16, verse three. Commit your works to the Lord and your thoughts will be established. Commit your works the things you do to the Lord. And if you'll do that, he'll make them successful. He'll, he'll, he'll bless them. If you commit the things you do to him, he's gonna make them blessed. All right, now here's, uh, and maybe this is a little insight into the way I, I study things, but I, I looked at that word commit and I, 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 I looked it up in a concordance. I'm not, I don't speak Hebrew and I don't speak Greek but I do know how to read a concordance and uh, can look up words. And the word commit here is the word galal. Now that's not important that you remember galal, but, but what it is, I think, is really memorable for you. The word galal is used 24 times in the Bible in 18 different verses. Only one time out of 24 uses is the word galal translated commit. Nine of the times the word is used, it is translated roll off. To roll off. The, the way it pertains to commit here is like roll off your works onto God. That, that's what it's talking about. Yeah, and so that's why the word commits used. It's a good word. It just, it just kind of hides the real flavor of what this is talking about. So galal, the word galal came from camel caravans. Now, this is interesting to me because I didn't know it. Camel caravans can have as many as like 150 camels in them. And back then, I don't know what the average size was, but it probably wasn't 150. But it was, you know, that's the way they traveled across the desert with all of their supplies and materials, like a camel caravan. And camels are unique animals in that they can store energy and water. Now, the hump on their back is not full of water like an ice chest, so don't think that. Some people do now, they think that. But it is, it is where fat is stored that, that holds water and holds energy. And it is used by the camel when they are out and can't get to water very readily or energy. Well, in a camel caravan, what the, 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 the caravan leader would do is load down as few camels as possible with the load. In other words, if you had a load that 15 camels could carry, but three or four of them could carry it also by themselves. They'd be really loaded down, but they could carry it. They would load those three or four camels down to the max. First of all, to make them behave. Secondly, um, because when they are loaded down, they use four to eight times as much water as they do when they're not loaded down. And depending on how heavy the load is, they use from four to eight times as much water. Well, you're taking a caravan across a long haul with no water. You load some of them down as, as much as possible and keep the others free so the others aren't using their water supply and these are. And then at some point out there, you take the load off of the ones you've loaded and put them on some other camels and then they can go that far and these still have enough reserve if they're not loaded to make it fine. And you just keep rotating it like that all the way across so that you can go further distances without having to stop and water up camels. Well, 
That means that during the trip, quite a few times, you're going to have to unload one camel and load it on another camel. So they developed a process that they called galal. And what galal is, is that when it comes time to, sh to take the load off and put it on another camel, the camel with the load kneels down and the camel you're loading it on kneels down and that camel with the load just rolls the load off. And so what does that say to us about prayer? What is prayer? What is committing our ways to the Lord? It, prayer is rolling the burden off. Now, if you get on your knees with a burden and you say, all right, I'm going to pray with this, and you get up and you're still carrying the burden, you hadn't prayed. You've just griped, you know, in the spirit to God, right? You hadn't, you hadn't rolled the burden off. You, you, you're still carrying the burden. I mean, here's what we do a lot of times. We come to the Lord and we say, Lord, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to unload my burden on you. I'm going to lay it down, Lord. I'm, I mean, look, I can't carry it anymore. I'm going to lay it at your feet. I'm going to lay my burden down. And I'm, 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 I'm going to do it right now because I just can't stand to carry this burden anymore. It's too heavy for me, and I really need some relief. So, God, I'm just going to, I'm just going to lay my burden down. Well, if you ain't going to do anything with it, I, you know, and, and that's what we do. We pick it back up. Now, because God doesn't do it fast enough for us, or we can't figure out what he's doing with it, but we don't lay it down. You got to roll... You roll your burden off. That's what prayer is all about. Now, do you think rolling your burden off could strengthen you in the way you do the Lord's work or the work in your life? Sure it could. God says this is a tool that the Messiah brings with him so that you can be strengthened in the midst of all of your anxiety and stress and strife and desert and barren wilderness and all of those kind of things. But you got to leave it. You know, sheep aren't intended to carry burdens. You, you understand this? I said it last week that nobody, I've never heard anybody say, you know, I'm about to go on a safari and I need to make sure I get me a couple of pack sheep. Right? Because she, sheep don't carry burdens, right? They break down. As a matter of fact, do you know that you as a sheep are only designed to carry a burden as far as Jesus' feet are from you? As a matter of fact, you're not even intended to walk with your burden. You're intended to just basically turn right around and lay it at the feet of Jesus. So that's what prayer is all about. And when we do that, it strengthens our feeble knees. You know. All right, number three. I'm going to hit it real quick. I know I'm late. He makes my fearful heart courageous. He strengthens my hands. He firms up my knees. And now, he's going to do something about this fearful heart. What does he do to it? Well, he makes it courageous. He fills it with courage. Well, how in the world would he do this? Well, in verse 4 of Isaiah 35, I'm going to quote it. I don't think I have another slide, Tanya, of it. I do? All right, well, I'm more thoughtful than I thought. All right. Look at what it says in verse four. Say to those who are fearful hearted, be strong and do not fear. Now notice what the heart does when it's not given over to the Lord. Fear comes in and fear takes over. This commandment says, do not fear, be strong. And when we see it in Isaiah 35, we think, man, that's a good word. But did you know that that phrase, be strong, do not fear, is used in the Bible more often than you think it is? And do you know how much 365 times you say, Brad? That's awesome. Thank you, B. That's my, that's my commentary right there. Billy and Brian, Bell's usually, she's, she'll be back, but that's my killer bees. They help me preach. Um, 
be strong, don't be afraid. Now, most of the time, that phrase is used between a spiritual father and a spiritual son. It's a spiritual father telling the spiritual son, be strong, son, don't be afraid. No reason for you to be afraid. And, and, and I want to show you one of those times. It was Joshua, Moses and Joshua. Now, you know, Moses led the children of Israel across the desert, blah, blah, came up to the promised land. They got a negative report from the 10 spies. We're grasshoppers. So they turned around. They wouldn't go in. Well, they, God brings them back again. With, and, but, and Moses is still leading them. He's 120 years old. He's still leading them. And, but God says to him, you're not going to get to go in, in the promised land. And um, Joshua's going to lead them in. And so you get him ready. And so Moses, three times, Moses says to Joshua, be strong and don't worry about it. And on top of that, three times, God says to Joshua, be strong and don't worry about it. And then one time, the people say to Joshua, be strong and don't worry about it. In other words, seven times. Let me, let me just show you. Deuteronomy 31, verse 6 and 7. This is Moses. Be strong and of good courage. Do not fear, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord your God, he's the one who goes with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Verse 7. Then Moses called Joshua and said to him in the sight of all Israel, be strong and of good courage. For you must go with this people to the land which the Lord has sworn sworn to their fathers uh, to give them, and you shall uh, cause them to inherit it. Uh, chapter 31, verse 23. Then he inaugurated Joshua. That means he laid his hands on him. That's what inaugurated means. Uh, Joshua, the son of Nun, and said, Be strong and of good courage, for you shall bring the children of Israel into the land which I swore to them, and I will be with you. Joshua 1, be strong, this is God, be strong and of good courage, for to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Verse 7, God again, only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded, uh, commanded you. Do not turn, uh, turn from it to the right hand or to the left that you may prosper wherever you go. Verse 9, have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And then the people in Joshua uh, chapter 1, verse 17 and 18, just as we heeded Moses in all things, so we will heed you. Only the Lord God be with you as he was with Moses. Whoever rebels against your command and does not heed your words in all that you command him shall be put to death. Only be strong and of good courage. Now, personally, if I was Joshua, right about now, I would be thinking, I wonder what lies ahead of me. I mean... I mean, seven times now you've been warned to be courageous. I'm thinking, man, what is up there that, that they're trying to help me with here, you know? Maybe I need to reconsider being the leader around here. Well, what Moses and God and Israel was doing to Joshua is they were putting a word into Joshua's spirit, into his heart. They were saying to Joshua... You don't have to be afraid because you're going to win because God is going to fight this battle for you. You don't have to worry about it. And this is a word for you. Just relax because God is with you and he's going to win this battle. And so steal your fearful heart because it's not your battle. It's God's battle and God is going to win this thing for you. Now, King David on his deathbed said to his son Solomon in 1 Kings, now the days of David drew near that he should die, and he charged Solomon his son, saying, I go the way of all the earth. Be strong, therefore, and prove yourself a man. Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, by the way, the book of 2 Timothy is the last letter Paul wrote, and within two years from writing what I'm about to read, he was dead. 
He wrote to Timothy, You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. So how do you become strong? You become strong in the grace of Christ Jesus. You become strong in the power of Christ Jesus, not by your might, not by your power, not by your cunning, not by your skill, not by your ability, not by your administration. You become powerful and your mission becomes accomplishable because you don't do it, God does it. And that's what God was saying to them. Get this word in your heart. Because if you have a word of God in your heart, it doesn't matter what comes against you. But if you don't have a word of God in your heart, the first thing that comes against you, you're going to be so full of fear and anxiety and stress that you'll be almost uh, you know, unconsolable here. So it's the word from God that you get in. Deuteronomy, the the scripture says to put the word of God in your heart. In other words, uh, do something on purpose with the word. Uh, It's good to hear it. And and you come in on Sunday and hear it or anytime you, you you hear it, that's wonderful. But God said, put it in your heart, which is much more than just simply listening to it. It's meditating on the word. <laughs> you know what? Meditate's kind of got a bad connotation because of, uh, of uh, what was her name oh, uh, that flew around? And uh, I can't think of her name now. It doesn't make any difference. I'll think of it tomorrow. She was wrong. Uh, but anyway, meditate simply means to think about it. Now, I like one of the, I looked up the word. <laughs> definitions. I kind of freak that way, but um, one of the definitions I love is meditate means to ponder by talking to yourself. Does anybody in here ever talk to themselves besides me? I talk to myself all the time. I do. I I talk, I talk, every once in a while, Tanya say, are you talking to me? Or she'll say, are you preaching again? You know, I'll be in there, and I, I walk around, and I talk to the Lord. I quote scripture. I, I preach sermons out loud. I mean, not, you know, just kind of soft, but I'm, I'm saying things out loud. I'm practicing saying them. I'm saying, all right, if I say it like this, and I put the inflection there, and, and, no, that's not good. Let me say it like this, and then it'll be, yeah, oh, that's better. I swear. You know, and I'll be just talking to myself like that. I know people, I used to, where I, where I worked in, in New Orleans uh, a few years ago, <laughs> they got, the guys that I worked with in a warehouse, we, we had to load up before we did work on, out in the field, and uh, they would, I mean, they asked me one time, they say, Mr. Keith, are, are you talking to yourself? I said, I said, yeah, yeah. Are you all right? You talking to yourself? I said, yeah. I said, I said, I, I'm, I'm a Christian man, and I, I talk to the Lord all the time. <laughs> and I said, just if you ever hear me, just listen. All right, <laughs> whatever it is I'm saying, just listen to it. But anyway, that so, but but that's what it, that I mean. We ponder, we meditate these things. We 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 put them in our in our heart. Let me show you Deuteronomy six six. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. Deuteronomy eleven. Therefore, you shall lay up these words of mine in your heart and in your soul, and bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. And of course, the big daddy of all these verses, Psalm 119, verse 11, your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. So this is just telling us that if we will meditate, if we will ponder these things, if we will intentionally place them in ourselves, then we will not be overcome by fear. If we don't do this, it, we are easily conquered by fear, our fearful heart. So the Messiah brings with him the word that comforts and gives courage to, I have never been afraid of anything when I had a word from the Lord. When I knew God spoke to me about something, I've lost churches over it. I've been run out. I've been dismissed. <laughs> I, I've, you know, uh, I've suffered a lot. 
had my salary cut, all kind of stuff. But that doesn't matter. If, God, if, if it's a word from God, it's a word from God. Freedom River Church exists because of a word from God. In spite of everything. Thank God. Thank God. Amen. I love you guys. Love, love talking, preaching, seeking. I mean, I know God's blessing and God's working. But anyway, here's a great scripture about what putting the word of God in your heart. And I'm quitting with this because I know y'all are getting anxious. This is a great verse, great couple, couple three verses on putting the word of God. This is what it'll do for you, okay? This is what it'll do. Psalm 1, verse 1 through 3. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. Everybody say, word of God. That's what law of the Lord is. And in his law, he meditates day and night. He walks around talking to himself <laughs> about God's word day and night. I wake up in the night and get up and go get in my recliner so I can talk. Because I can't talk to Tanya, it wakes her up. <laughs> and, he, and this is what will happen to you now. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season. You're not going to be a freak that doesn't bear fruit at the right time or the wrong season of life. You learn how to live, how to act, how to represent God, how to win people, how to be in favor. Your fruit's not going to fall off because it came in the wintertime when it should have come in the springtime. So you're going to know it's going to give you discernment. It's going to give you direction that brings forth its fruit in its season whose leaf also shall not wither and whatever he does shall prosper. And whatever he does will prosper. That's the word. All right, so... That's strength. What does God do for us in the wilderness? He gives us strength to help us go through this wilderness. Now, there are three more things, <laughs> but this is the first one. All right, so let's bow our heads.